Well, good day, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Strategies for Better Incident Response. I am your host, Todd Stone. Today's presenter is Josh Drake. In just a moment, Josh will present his insights on incident response strategies. This webinar is presented by the Research SOC, the National Science Foundation Security Operations Center for Research. If you're not familiar with the Research SOC, it's an NSF-sponsored collaboration of multiple institutions that provides operational services and training to NSF research organizations, facilities, and projects. These services include a 24 by 7 by 365 SOC monitoring capability with the OmniSOC, vulnerability scanning, honeypots, decoy computers, threat intelligence, and training. And the research SOC has recently begun offering virtual security teams. More information about these services and the research SOC can be found at researchsoc.iu.edu. With that, let's bring on our presenter. Josh, please take it away. Hello, everyone, and uh, thanks, Todd. Um, so my name is Josh Drake, and I'm a senior security analyst at the IU Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research. Uh, I have a 15-year uh, background working as a system administrator, network administrator, uh, and security analyst. Uh, Currently, I'm here uh, working for Research SOC, which is one of uh, the NSF-funded grants that I, I'm a part of, where I am a security analyst and project liaison. Um, I also am part of the Open Science Grid uh, security team, where I handle incident response uh, training and security exercises, and I uh, co-run the IAM working group for the CI-COE pilot and Trusted CI. Uh, today we're going to talk about some incident response strategies, and I have two goals for the talk. Um, the first one is that we're going to provide a framework so that you can start to develop uh, your own strategies uh, for incident response that are tailored to your organization. And the second is to go into depth on some uh, key actions you can take during particular stages of incident response uh, that will um, provide some strategies that will let you uh, customize those for your own organization. Okay, we're going to start off with talking about incidents. Um, an incident, in this case a computer incident, is uh, described as a series of events that result in a compromise or the threat of compromise to your physical or digital assets. Incidents are not always malicious. Uh, they are oftentimes inadvertent or accidental, and most incidents that you deal with are not going to be catastrophic. Uh, the vast majority of incidents that we uh, declare and, and catalog are low and moderate severity incidents um, that are relatively minor in scope. The uh, incident response is the function is the uh, series of tasks we undertake when dealing with an incident. Incident response should have uh, four main functions, and these are in no particular order um, because they will be different for each organization and their mission. But the four functions are we want to minimize the negative impact of the event that is happening. Um, we want to restrict whatever loss of confidentiality, integrity, or availability is going on. And we want to limit the damage to our reputation. Uh, we further want to use incident response to collect information about whatever event has happened. We want to be able to determine what has happened to which of our assets. When I was a, a kid, we would um, learn about essay writing. And one of the things that they would point out was you have to answer the questions, who, what, when, where, why, and how, right? And so we want to be able to describe those same uh, answers in our incident response uh, information gathering. This helps us with a number of things. It helps us to understand the uh, extent of the incident. It also helps us to better understand our own systems for uh, future, uh, future use in maturing our security program. And it uh, serves as a good starting point for gathering information if there is going to be uh, involvement of law enforcement or legal action after the fact. A third function of incident response is communication. We want to be able to effectively keep our personnel and our internal and external stakeholders informed. Uh, as well as any mandated reporting you may have to your governing body or compliance organizations. This can also help manage reputation loss uh, in high-profile events, effective communication. 
And finally, uh, maintaining the operational availability of our systems and services uh, and infrastructure to our users and clients. Now, which of those gets prioritized in your organization is gonna depend largely on your own operational objectives. Um, and we're gonna provide some strategies for uh, prioritizing those later on. All uh, incident response that is effective, I think has three common uh, elements. It should be prepared, should be systematic, and it should be iterative. Uh, if you were here for my security exercises uh, seminar in February, these will seem familiar to you because I believe security is a process and not a product. And so starting from a foundation and building maturity on top of that is key to improving your inf information security platform. And these are the three steps I think people should take. Prepare, be systematic about it, and iterate constantly. Continue to mature. When I say prepared, one thing I'm talking about is having uh, defined in advance methods for key tasks during incident response. Um, these include assigning the roles and responsibilities to your staff, uh, documenting uh, the incident and having uh, channels for communicating and storing that documentation, and then having defined thresholds for validating and escalating an incident. We should also think about what strategies we're going to undertake to contain malicious behavior on our systems uh, before an incident occurs. And we wanna also consider uh, our strategies for maintaining operational security during incident response. Uh, incident response should also be systematic. We want our response playbook to align with our organizational priorities. And we want to make sure that we are giving uh, the actions we're taking line up with what we have stated our organizational objectives. And finally, we want uh, this to be an iterative process. Uh, incident response should not be a document that sits on a shelf or in that folder and no one knows where it is. And then you have to go digging for it when you have an incident. We want this to be a, a document that uh, your security team especially is involved with regularly. Uh, it needs to be easy to find for anyone who's gonna be involved in response. It needs to be easy to read and understand. And it should be frequently referenced and continually updated as you respond to incidents and do security exercises to test your response. Okay. So let's say that uh, we're, we're coming to this fresh from uh, an organization that has just started to build a security uh, program. What are some things that you need to have in place before you can build an incident response playbook? Uh, here's a checklist we've put together. Um, I think you need to define your organizational objectives as they relate to your information security platform. You want to uh, explicitly define roles and responsibilities, and we'll talk more about that in just a second. And then we want to gather and maintain a, a somewhat accurate inventory of assets and risks. So we want to know what assets we have, both physical and digital, and we want to know what uh, the vulnerabilities that are inherent to our system are uh, so that we can categorize those and start to remediate them over time. Once you have uh, those three uh, items, uh, you can start to put together what we call a master information security policies and procedures document. This is the core of your information security system or platform. And uh, if you need help doing this sort of thing, Trusted CI has created a, a very helpful guide. It's at trustedci.org slash guide. We'll have links to that later on. I, see, I saw someone ask about slides, and yes, we will have these available um, on our website later on, and there'll be a link to that website at the end of the presentation. And then once you have your uh, master information security policy written, you can start to use that to draft your incident response playbook and policy. I mentioned a moment ago uh, some key responsibilities uh, that we need to have um, documented before we start uh, our incident response procedures. And I think the most important ones of these to define are who is going to be responsible for declaring an incident, validating that something has happened and announcing that it is going to be dealt with using the incident response playbook. Who is responsible for forming the team for incident response? Uh, let's see, Todd, I think we're on the wrong slide. Okay. There, there we go. go. 
and uh, who is going to be responsible for your communication strategy while you're responding to an incident. And these responsibilities should be defined uh, as belonging to key roles within your organization. We don't want them to be design, assigned to an individual person uh, so that you can have, um, you know, the hit by a bus scenario where someone was responsible for too many things and no one else uh, knows how to do those things. And so they get hit by a bus and, and you don't have anyone that can handle it. So make sure you're uh, assigning these two roles and having backups for each role. And when you test uh, these situations, you want to make sure that you're including the backups uh, and not just the key people in your security exercises. So with that, uh, we'll take a little break and do some polls um, before we dive into the second part. So we'll go ahead and launch this poll. Thank you very much for your participation. We can see those results coming in. And we'll leave this poll open for just a few more for just a few more seconds. So as we can see, everyone should be able to see those results. We, about 48% of us have an a, uh, MISP in place. Uh, about 24% are working on them. About 24, 28% um, don't have one in place yet. Let's go ahead and launch our second poll then. You have an incident response policy in place. And again, we thank you for your participation. The results are coming in very quickly. We'll leave this open for about another 10 seconds. I'll go ahead and close this poll and share the results. As you can see, Josh, about 62% have a policy in place, another 27% are working on one, and about 12% do not have one. Awesome. I'll close this poll. And back to you. Thanks. Um, yeah, that's, that's interesting. I think about half uh, uh, in both polls had uh, the policies in place and about a quarter are working on those policies. So for those of you who um, are working on one or developing or don't have one in place yet, the, uh, the QR code here and this link will take you to the trustedci.org guide, which um, in addition to, to sort of providing a general set of guidelines for building an information security uh, program also has templates for uh, building a, a MISP and also uh, incident response playbook. A lot of uh, the incident response that uh, we use in the NSF organizations that uh, I work with uh, comes from the trusted CI guidelines and um, uh, the content of this webinar also is, is pulled partially from those guidelines. So I would encourage you to take a look at those if you haven't or if you're working on that process now. So uh, back into our incident response playbook. The second part here of the webinar, we're going to uh, take a look at sort of the more detail oriented tasks involved in incident response. Um, and like I said, these are not one size fits all. Um, actions are going to differ based on the type of incident you're responding to, um, as well as the type of organization you have. If you're an organization that primarily uh, provides a service to clients, then your response is going to look different than if you're an organization that primarily uh, provides like a data portal for uh, research data or something like that. Um, and for those who are not in the scientific community, um, this will look even, even more different uh, than it does um, for those of us who work on uh, public uh, science programs. So the next set of slides is going to be different stages of the incident response workflow. Uh, they're roughly in a chronological order, but it's important to note that not all steps happen sequentially. Um, many of these steps happen concurrently with one another, uh, and some of them happen uh, as in the background of every single uh, other step in the, in the workflow. So uh, just keep that in mind as we move forward. 
Okay. So the first step in any incident response <clears throat> is going to be uh, detecting and identifying that an incident is happening. Uh, you cannot practice incident response without being aware that an incident has occurred. Um, there's also a direct correlation between the time to detection of an incident and what the impact and costs of recovery and managing that incident, incident are going to be. Um, I'm not going to cover all the information that's on these slides. We're going to focus primarily on the actions and strategies section. But again, these slides will be available after the webinar for you to go back and look at. Uh, during the identification and detection phase, we want to focus on a few key actions. Um, we want to be reviewing logs, uh, beginning our documentation process, and capturing raw data. Uh, oftentimes, uh, your incident response, depending on the maturity of your organization, uh, may come from automated sources. If you have an intrusion detection or intrusion prevention system, uh, it could come from syslog. Uh, data or uh, alerts that you have set up, but oftentimes it's going to come from user or client reports about uh, anomalous behavior with your systems. So we want to make sure that uh, we are taking those uh, incidents as they get reported and uh, making sure that we are documenting them so that they can be analyzed and escalated. Some strategies for doing this effectively. Uh, one is to empower and train your staff so that they can report on indicators of compromise when they see them. Uh, oftentimes you see that you find an incident and there were indications that something was happening much earlier than your initial reports, uh, tickets, or uh, user reports, emails uh, of things that were going on directly related to the incident that weren't put together uh, for some time afterwards. So make sure that that is uh, a process that is easy for your staff to do uh, and to escalate up the chain when necessary. Um, another key strategy here is to make sure you have adequate security controls in place so that you're capturing uh, the data that you need to identify an incident. I think a, a good place to start at a minimum is having a, an IDS in place. Um, I'd like to see everyone have some sort of syslogging available. Um, Centralized is great. If you don't have centralizing uh, syslog, at least be capturing it so that you can grab it later. Um, and then <clears throat> conducting uh, regular security exercises uh, doesn't help necessarily with the actual identification process, but what it can do is provide a sense of ownership for non-security uh, and non-technical uh, focused staff to uh, belong to this process as well. The second uh, workflow uh, item here is documentation. And documentation happens um, at all stages during our response process. Um, having uh, good data gathering and a key and a timeline of what has happened is gonna make it much easier when we get to um, the recovery and eradication stage. Uh, it's going to make it easier when we have to report at the end of this process, uh, and it's going to help us to improve the process when we're finished with incident response. Um, the things that I like to see people uh, record during uh, an incident are uh, timestamps for actions that they take during the process. Uh, I'd also like to see uh, timestamps for discoveries made, uh, as well as observations uh, of the process along the way. Um, you should consider that your uh, normal means of communication documentation may not be available during an incident, depending on the severity. And so I always encourage people to have an analog backup or even a primary analog system for taking notes during an incident. Um, you may not be able to access certain digital resources, but a notebook and a piece of uh, a pen or piece of paper is, is invaluable in just jotting down uh, observations as they happen. And then one element that uh, may be more relevant for some organizations than other is uh, protecting the evidence that you gather here and maintaining a chain of custody, especially if you're uh, in a sort of situation where there could be uh, legal ramifications, uh, potential compliance uh, ramifications. You want to make sure that you can back up and prove uh, the observations you make during the response process. Um, some other things to think about here are having offline storage available to store the observations that you're making so that if your, um, your systems are compromised to the extent that uh, you can't verify the integrity of your data, you're not storing uh, incident response documentation there and you're putting them on a separate device and uh, as well as um, having some sort of imaging software to capture 
uh, machine states during this process is very helpful as well. Now, uh, everyone's going to have different levels of resources available to them, depending on the maturity of your program. But uh, a lot of these things, the pen and paper, thumb drives, etc., uh, can be done by just about anyone. Uh, the next step here that we're going to take a look at is to uh, look at the escalation steps. Escalation and identification often go hand in hand, um, but the key things, actions we want to see taken during escalation is that the uh, information gathered is being reported to the people who can make a decision about declaring an incident. So whoever those people are in your uh, incident response policy, we wanna make sure that they are getting their hands or eyes on the information uh, to determine if an incident has occurred uh, and then to declare that an incident is happening and begin to form a response team. An incident response team doesn't necessarily have to be defined in your playbook. Um, it can be comprised of all different members of your organization, both inside and potentially uh, outside consultants or law enforcement, but um, you should have someone defined as the person who will form and coordinate that team once you are in the process of responding. Uh, some good strategies to consider here are to have clear escalation uh, paths in place in your policy and then uh, to both define the role of, of defining, uh, declaring an incident and make certain that the person who is responsible for doing that knows that that's their responsibility. When I have done tabletop exercises for incident response, trying to teach teams how to do this, um, everyone just sort of takes for granted that uh, the incident response process is being invoked because we're at the tabletop exercise. Um, so make sure that you're, you're taking the time to define what is an incident and what is not, and going through and categorizing the severity of that incident so you can know uh, what level of uh, resource needs to be devoted to the response process. And then another good way to see how this works in action is with security exercises. Um, get, your, get your team together, uh, run through this uh, in a hypothetical exercise, and just um, see where the gaps in your system are, see where the ball gets dropped, and refine your policies to adjust to that. So containment is the first, uh, I think, sort of urgent time sensitive thing that happens. And oftentimes our um, identification is happening in the background. Uh, we might sometimes find an incident as it's occurring. More often we're going to run into it after the fact. Um, our escalation process needs to be timely, but um, I doubt your CISO is uh, going to be looking at logs at two in the morning unless uh, something very bad is going on. So containment is, is really the step here where you need to stop the bad stuff from happening. Um, the actions during the containment phase uh, are going to work to uh, isolate and disconnect compromised assets from the rest of your system so that you can prevent lateral movement. Um, you want to shut down sources of uh, of compromise, uh, wherever if you can determine where the attackers have, have gotten in, or if the uh, incident is uh, inadvertent, then figuring out what is the cause of that and, and stopping them as soon as possible. Um, a lot of times our reaction to bad things happening on our network is to just shut it down. Um, and I want to caution you against doing that. Um, I've had real world cases where we were dealing with an incident um, and something that happened and we needed to uh, figure out um, via logs what had actually been compromised. Um, and these were container-based uh, applications. And when the incident was communicated to the operations team, they just shut everything down and those, uh, those logs were not shipped out of those containers. And so we, we lost all ability to sort of trace the extent of the incident when the containers went down. So be very careful. Um, definitely do your best to stop the incursion, but be careful you're not destroying crucial information that you're gonna need later in the response process. Um, that's why I always like to say, uh, in a reminder from the documentation screen, that you should be capturing uh, system state data from affected systems if at all possible, uh, because you never know what's going to be relevant as you get into the investigation of recovery process. Uh, another step in the containment uh, workflow is not just physical segmentation or network segmentation, but also uh, looking at affected accounts and services and disabling those. Um, and considering what your um, 
ultimate goal during the containment process is. In some cases, if the damage being done uh, is, is not immediate, it might be worth your while to gather more information about the attack by simply isolating the systems and observing them. Um, this is where operational security comes in. Uh, that is a, a bigger topic and something uh, we may do a future uh, webinar on. But for now, I would say just um, define those in your information response policy and stick to those guidelines as you're handling the response process. And again, continue to document all the actions that you take during this process and the things you discover uh, with timestamps so that you can use them when it comes time to uh, perform a root cause analysis later on in the process. The next stage in response is recovery. And recovery uh, sort of, I've condensed a few different things onto this one slide under recovery. Um, I'm also including in this one um, in the investigation process uh, to some extent, uh, communication strategies um, and validation, uh, but under the one headline of recovery for this, uh, this webinar. Um, actually, actions that we want to undertake during the recovery process are to uh, revise our determination of the severity of the incident. We've probably given the incident uh, uh, severity when we escalated it at the uh, initial phase, um, but we should have enough information when we're working on the recovery phase to uh, refine that and accurately categorize it. Once we've determined that severity and the extent of compromise that we have, uh, we can take a look at the long and uh, short-term impacts of the incident and start to build a uh, recovery strategy. Um, we want to determine uh, what systems are affected, uh, how long we can afford to have those down, uh, what our resources devoted to recovering from the incident are going to be and what the timeline is going to look like. As part of that, we also want to make sure we have an effective communication strategy in place, that we are uh, communicating key information to the people that need to know it, uh, and that we are um, not contradicting ourselves or, or uh, increasing the damage to reputation uh, that can occur if we have uh, poorly coordinated communication. And then we want to make sure that the uh, resources that are identified are uh, assigned to the incident response team, and we can execute that strategy effectively. Now, uh, some strategies to think about during the recovery process. Um, one of the things that I think you wanna have a discussion about in the preparation stage is determining um, the risk involved uh, for storing versus rebuilding compromised systems. Um, restoring systems from backups is going to be faster. Um, but rebuilding them from scratch and then um, reprocessing the data or restoring the data to a rebuilt hardened system is going to be more secure. And so there's a trade-off to be made there. Um, we are not shooting for just returning to the state we were in before the incident when we're practicing recovery. What we want to be shooting for is a state of returning to uh, operational uh, status quo, but with an improved security posture uh, because we have more information. We know that there was a, an inadvertent uh, event or an attack that has compromised our systems, and so we should not just be content to revert to the state we were in before. We need to revert to that state and harden those systems so that we don't have the same incident happen again. Uh, during this phase, you also uh, want to carefully consider if you will involve outside resources. Um, some of you may have uh, incident response teams available to you uh, from outside security consultants. Uh, that's one thing that Research SOC is working on providing to our clients. Uh, but other times you may want to consider if law enforcement, uh, you want them to be involved or if you're required to have them involved or governing bodies um, may need to be involved in your response. And then another uh, strategy I'll attack on here is um, to define a person that will handle your communications, especially externally. You want to have a single voice speaking about the process. Oh, so eradication is removing all traces of the uh, compromise from our systems and hardening our systems to a state that that same uh, incident is, is not going to be happening to us again. Um, key actions for the eradication stage of response uh, are going to be verifying that all indicators of compromise are gone from your systems, 
um, gathering as much information as you can from the documentation that has taken place during your other steps. And if you have the resources available, performing a root cause analysis. Um, this is not necessarily required for all severity of incidents. Sometimes your incident is just going to be, um, you know, you had someone who found a list of email and was trying to uh, do a brute force password attack. And you don't necessarily need a root cause analysis or something like that. But when you have more complex, uh, wider spread issues, uh, taking the time to look at all systems, analyze that forensic data you gathered by imaging systems, and figuring out what the root cause and source of uh, compromise was will allow you to be much more confident that you've eradicated the threat to your system. Uh, this is a good uh, time to address failed or compromised controls and systems within your organization. Um, a lot of uh, incidents uh, still uh, come from the low hanging fruit. They're not necessarily targeted attacks. They're uh, compromised credentials their uh, poor patching infrastructure or schedules um, and devices that were just simply not hardened adequately when they were installed. Uh, this is also where you want to take those systems where you've restored or rebuilt them during the recovery phase and validate that the, the information on those systems is fully recovered, has uh, full integrity um, as much as you can, and that uh, you've hardened those systems against future attacks. And then you want to monitor uh, the systems that were affected during your incident. Um, elevate your monitoring practices, especially on those systems where you might have had compromise or lateral movement, and uh, test those things that you think you fixed with security exercises uh, so that the um, assumptions you're making during the recovery and eradication stage don't come back to bite you uh, later on. Once you've gotten to the point of being fairly confident that you've eradicated all indicators of compromise uh, from your systems, you want to follow up with uh, some, some final reporting steps and actions. Um, this is where you're gonna perform your uh, post-mortem. It's where you're gonna uh, create reports for your internal and external stakeholders. Uh, it's where you're going to sit down and review your, your processes uh, with the incident response team and look over your policies. Um, you want to take this uh, opportunity here to assess damages and costs uh, as much as you possibly can. Um, that's going to be much easier uh, in some industries than others. Um, right? Banks can probably have a much easier time defining their losses in terms of, of financial value than we can in the science community, um, where an incident uh, might cost us, how do you define that, for science? Um, some good indications uh, of uh, costs. Uh, we have another webinar that Susan Sons gave a couple months ago on effective security metrics. So that's one place you might start if you're in a non-commercial uh, field, especially uh, science-based organizations, uh, to determine what sort of measures you can use uh, to see what the impact of these sorts of incidents has been. Um, we want to make sure that we're uh, creating a report uh, that our stakeholders can read. Um, a lot of times incident response can read uh, quite uh, skewed heavily to the technical side. Um, and while that's helpful to have, especially for other technical people that may be reviewing it, um, I'd encourage you to put a lot of that information into an appendix. Um, your report that you are gonna distribute to your non-technical uh, stakeholders should be narrative focused, it should be fairly easy to read, um, and it should, shouldn't be terribly uh, any, any longer than it needs to be because what you want to have is the full uh, understanding and vetting of your incident response process with people who are outside of that team. Um, this is also a time when you should uh, consider uh, if you haven't involved law enforcement um, doing so, if that's required. And it should also be a time when you review what your uh, legal or compliance mandated uh, reporting requirements are uh, so that you make sure you haven't overlooked those during the process. And if you find ones that you have uh, overlooked I would encourage you to add those to your IR playbook. Um, one thing that uh, I think 
is, is key once you get to this final stage of the response process and closing an incident is to uh, take note of the things that worked and the things that didn't uh, and track those for future security exercises as well as the changes we've made to our controls and policies. Make sure you're testing those in between incidents. Um, don't wait for a big incident to test your incident response. Make sure you're practicing this uh, in full on even small incidents that don't necessarily warrant it so that you can have the experience of using the document and maturing it uh, so that it's ready when you do need it. The um, final slide here, uh, I've relinked the trustedci.org slash guide section. Um, but there are some things I'd like to, to go over before we get into questions um, that I think are most important for you to remember. Um, so remember that most incidents are not high severity. Uh, most of the things that you declare as an incident should be low and moderate severity. Um, threats, um, inadvertent uh, attacks, uh, inadvertent accidents, things like that are going to compromise uh, probably the larger portion of your, your incidents. But make sure you're practicing incident response on those incidents when they happen. Um, practice and experience are your most effective tools at, at being calm and systematic when you respond to incidents. So using it as often as possible and uh, conducting security exercises is going to make you better at incident response. And remember that security is a process and not a product. Um, if you don't have an information security program or an incident response playbook today, um, start simple. Um, start with the template, start plugging in uh, your own organizational priorities and build from there. Um, it's important that we are taking steps in the right direction and worrying about what you don't have in place now is not going to improve your security tomorrow. Um, take the concrete steps that are available to you and start building on them in the direction you want to go and eventually you'll get there. So I would encourage everyone, uh, especially the um, I think 40% of you that don't currently have uh, incident response policy or playbook in place today to go ahead and uh, take a template and start building and practicing it so that you can begin to build some maturity. So thanks, Josh. Well, that's a great presentation. I'm going to go ahead and launch our final poll. And we'd like to know if you or your organization have responded to an incident in the last 90 days. And I'll leave this open for about the next 10, 15 seconds or so, but thank you for your participation. I think that's all our answers. Let's go ahead and I'll share the results of that. Again, about 60% of us have had an incident in the last 90 days, responded to an incident in the last 90 days, with a little over just 41% of us uh, have not had an incident. So That's interesting. I'm, I'm wondering if um, those numbers are somewhat higher uh, due to the changes that have happened in most of our workflows in the last 90 days as well. I know on, on my side, we're, we're dealing with a lot of problems of, of people taking stuff home, working from home, and uh, working with equipment that isn't uh, subject to our usual security policies. So that's pretty interesting. I know we have organizations of many different sizes uh, represented here. So uh, very, very interesting. Um, I did see that there was a question uh, in the chat while I was uh, talking earlier um, about uh, what is a good tool uh, for logging. Um, I, I'm assuming uh, they mean documentation. Um, and so I'll say that uh, for my groups, um, we typically use our organization's uh, Google documents um, just because it's easy to collaborate uh, and we can uh, work on those uh, and at the same time, we don't have to worry about conflicting files. And uh, when our security teams are spread out geographically, it makes it easy to see things. Um, I tend to take notes on uh, local uh, note tracking apps on my, uh, on my operating system. Uh, I also keep a quite extensive notebook, um, several notebooks around for different uh, organizations I work for and try to keep handwritten notes uh, together in there. Um, I, I know teams that have worked with uh, uh, things like Keybase uh, in the past and Signal for doing um, coordinated incident response at a distance. Um, I found those to be pretty uh, difficult to do. 
um, depending on uh, what you're trying to, to get done, uh, just because the timeline of, of what's happening and the alerting isn't necessarily instantaneous enough. Uh, Daniel, so then data are stored on Google servers. Yes, in this case, that's true. Um, and that uh, complies with our uh, master information security policy that we have in terms of where we're allowed to store uh, data of that sort. Um, I do work with organizations that have policies that don't allow that sort of thing to be stored on, on those uh, sort of servers. Um, and so on those organizations, they will have a, a different method of, of storing their notes, but I'm not exactly sure what they're using. Um, so uh, let's see. Todd, do you want to handle the questions? I, it's hard for me to keep track. Sure. Of I, uh, do we have, if we have, uh, Daniel asked the last question about storing uh, data on the Google Drive, and Josh didn't respond to that. What other questions do we have from our attendees today? I think I saw a hand raised, uh, but I lost the notification. Don't see any open questions. Q and A. So, well, thank you, Josh, and uh, for that great presentation. Uh, that was very informative. We appreciate the information. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. There are no other questions. Uh, you can find more information um, on the Research SOC on the Research SOC website. And here's Josh's contact information as well as the contact information for um, the Research SOC website. Again, we thank you for your time. Uh, we encourage you to reach out and contact us. And this concludes our webinar for today. For those who are looking for the slides and recording, it normally takes between uh, 24 and uh, 48 hours for our recordings to process. I would look for those Monday or Tuesday, for both of those Monday or Tuesday on the Research SOC website on our webinars page. Again, thank you so much for attending. This concludes our webinar.